welcome to this discussion on correct affairs uh, we begin with the question that we mentioned in our previous session that we will discuss this class in this class this was discussed in the previous class but i want to discuss couple of ideas that are mentioned on the slide right there one is the lac the line of actual control and the second one is the loc the line of control so what exactly is the line of control let's begin with the line of control I have a couple of maps with for you. See, this is not how India looks. Uh, and please remember, this is just for information sake. These are not the external boundaries of India. Like what's mentioned, Gilgit, but you know, this is um, under Pakistani occup occupation, this area. See, th even the boundaries, uh, as we see um, between Ladakh and Jammu and Kashmir in the erstwhile state of JNK are not mentioned here. This is this map showcases the presence of three countries, uh, two more countries in today's Ladakh and JNK apart from our own country. Now, while we have ownership of this country, the, this area, you need to remember that large portions of this uh, this territory are controlled by Pakistan and China. So what exactly is the LOC? And just before that, let me make you familiar with a few things. This you see this thing, this thing, uh, this area here, Aksai Chin. This is Aksai Chin. This entire, you see the color here. This is Aksai Chin. This is area in Ladakh that's controlled by, you know, uh, China. This is about thirty-seven thousand square kilometers. Yes, yes, thirty-seven thousand square kilometers. Now look at this area. This is all occupied by Pakistan. This area. Okay, this is all occupied by Pakistan and um, I'll come to the you know the other area that ceded by Pakistan to China in a while but I want you to become familiar with this area because see this is uh, this is occupied this occupies substantial proportion of our newspaper our media space uh, our mind space given that uh, the rivalry with China and the rivalry with Pakistan has come to dominate India's strategic discourse for you know for a long time now, and it will continue to dominate for the years to come. In the years to come, we need to become familiar with this. So, what is the LOC, the line of control? See, India and Pakistan went uh, the separate ways. That is, partitioned. India was partitioned into Pakistan and India. This was August 15, 1947. Now there were some princely states which were which chose not to become a part of either Pakistan or India. Now three prominent would be Hyderabad, the state of Hyderabad, you know, then uh, Junakar in Gujarat, and then Kashmir. Kashmir in those days was ruled by a Hindu Maharaja, though majority of the population was Muslim. And when we say majority of the population, we are discussing the population in the Srinagar Valley. Because in Jammu area, is all you know, majority was Hindu population, and in the you know what you call Ladakh area, Leh Ladakh, that was all Buddhist in those days. So when we say it's a Muslim majority area, please remember that Muslims concentrate constitute a substantial proportion of the population only in the valley, the Krishnagar Valley. But now, of course, they also number in the 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 numbers are going up in the Jammu area as well. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know a little about the first India-Pakistan War of 1948. So the Pakistanis were there; they occupied, they attacked India. Um, you know when. They attacked India in the sense that they attacked Kashmir now. So because now we regard Kashmir as ours, which is of course ours, but we need to understand something here. At the time of our independence, the Maharaj of Kashmir, Hari Singh, decided to join neither India nor Pakistan. He said, I'll remain independent. But then the two nation theory, you know, proposed by Muhammad Ali Jinnah and uh, advocated by Jinnah himself, who said that, look, Hindus and Muslims are two separate nations and hence could never live in peace together. That's what he said. But you need to understand something here that uh, by the logic of this partition, Jinnah said, Muslim majority Kashmir should go to Pakistan. But I mentioned it was not all Muslim majority. Okay. So the Pakistanis attacked you know, Kashmir, they attacked JNK. As they attacked, uh, you know, the Indian, it was a sovereign independent state. So if the government of India didn't intervene directly, 
it was not even a part of India. So the Maharaj of Kashmir approached India and consequently subsequent he is um, signing the instrument of accession with India that is merging Kashmir with India. We sent our army, our defense forces and our defense forces, uh, you know, stood their ground, pushed back the Pakistanis in many areas. But then the fighting started, you know, it was fierce in certain sectors. Now the Pakistanis went to the UN. The Pakistanis went to the UN. Look, it's the Pakistanis who went to the UN. And the Pakistanis claimed that um, India is um, illegally occupying this area. But then we told the UN and the international community that, look, we have already promised the Pakistan with the, the people of Kashmir a referendum. Because at the time of just after the signing of the instrument of accession, which is the signing of merger agreement, basically signing of a merger of JNK with India. You know, uh, we, that is Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, Prime Minister of India, promised the people of Kashmir that, look guys, given the circumstances in which you become, your state has become a part of India, you have had no right, uh, no say, basically, in, in, in this entire matter. So, once, you know, um, things settle down, we will conduct a referendum, a plebiscite, uh, which will give you the right uh, to choose independence, go back to what you were or remain with India. Now, the Indians said that, look, this is what we have pro already promised the people of Kashmir. But, you know, when the UN passed a ceasefire resolution on 31st October 1948, remember, this is the first war started in October, you know, a little over just after independence but the ceasefire was started you know came into place into effect on this day so first january 1949 and the new story starts look we told the un we will hold the referendum provided that pakistan fulfills an important condition in the you know in the referendum that is before the referendum. That is, it should withdraw all of its forces from, you know, from occupied territories. If Pakistanis do not withdraw, then we will not conduct the referendum. So this is an important condition. What people in liberals in India, you know, Pakistanis, they forget that they always talk about when India should hold a referendum. But there is an important condition that India would hold the referendum only if you know, the Pakistanis withdraw their forces from the occupied territories of Gilgit, Baltistan, you know, what do you call Ajat Kashmir, what they call. These are their names, not our names. So, um, you know, we stopped fighting around this line. We stopped fighting around this line where the Indian force, this is where the Indian forces were and this is where the Pakistani forces were. Fair? So this line where we stopped fighting is called the ceasefire line of 1949. The ceasefire line. Where? So remember the ceasefire line is the ceasefire line that is where we, India and Pakistan stopped fighting on, you know, at the end of the first war. Now, we didn't stop fighting there itself. We continued our wars, 65 we fought war, then 71 we fought a war over Bangladesh, what later became Bangladesh. Now, India, you know, India captured 90,000 prisoners of war belonging to Pakistan. Now, these soldiers could have been used by Prime Minister Indira Gandhi as a bargaining chip, but we had immense pressure from the Soviet Union and the United States to maintain status quo. That is, we could have told the Pakistanis, look guys, your 90,000 soldiers are with us. You want them, then withdraw all your forces. Give, you know, vacate the entire occupied territories. So we will we will get you know get back our JNK as it was in 19 the time of signing of instrument of accession. But then the US and the UN uh, USSR intervened and said let like, let's not you know um, rev up the matters. Let's not increase attentions. Let's go for status quo. What it was before you know that meeting in 1972 in Shimla. Let it be there. That is this condition, the ceasefire line. So, Indira Gandhi, of course, we were a weak nation in those days, not a powerful country, not a very powerful country. We were dependent on the world for aid, for wheat, for milk powder, a lot of things, my friends. And industrially, we weren't doing great. Economically, we were not doing great. 
politically, strategically, we were not a big player. So we didn't have that kind of voice. So we said, okay, we'll go for status quo. So the 1972, you know, Shimla agreement converted the ceasefire line into the LOC. It converted the ceasefire line into LOC. So this ceasefire line became the line of control in 1972. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, it is not the international boundary between India and Pakistan. It is just the ceasefire line between India and Pakistan in JNK. That's it. JNK. Okay. So that's a LOC, my friends. That's a LOC. The line of control over, you know, on one side of the line, it's a Pakistani control. The other side of the line is the Indian control of the territory. Now, in the Pakistani side, there are three major areas. One is Gilgit, or people also call it Gilgit, Baltistan, okay, and then this area called Ajat Kashmir. Now, India treats this boundary, this is the main boundary, this is the international boundary between India and Pakistan. This India treats it as international boundary, international border. But Pakistan calls it working border. It calls it working border. So, the international boundary between India and Pakistan in the territory of JNK and Ladakh, Upper Ladakh, yeah. So, that is uh, international boundary as far as we are concerned, but is termed the working border by Pakistan. Okay. So, that's the story of the LOC. And together, India and Pakistan share a boundary that runs for 3,310 kilometers. 3310 boundary between India and Pakistan. Here, yeah. one more thing here. You know, you see this, this Gujarat boundary, this is Pakistan, okay, this is Pakistan. So you have this Gujarat boundary, Rajasthan boundary. This boundary between Gujarat, Rajasthan, between you know, where you have Rajasthan, Punjab, till end Punjab here, okay, till here. Let me just. Uh, this particular um, notepad is not working well. Yeah, till here. Between here and this area is called the Radcliffe line. What is it called? The Radcliffe line. So, ladies and gentlemen, not the entire boundary between India and Pakistan is, you know, the Radcliffe line. Kashmir, aside Kashmir. Maybe we could discuss this. Okay. There was this lawyer, a British lawyer called Cyril Radcliffe, who drew the boundary lines between India and Pakistan. And in those days, Pakistan also included East Pakistan, which my, which is today's Bangladesh. Okay, so that's the LOC. To cut a long story short, that's the LOC. Now you see this area here. You see this uh, some area here that is ceded by Pakistan to China. This is about 5,800 square kilometers. This is our territory occupied by China, but has been given in gift to, oh, sorry, it has been occupied by Pakistan, but it has been given by Pakistan in gift to China. You got it? Our territory occupied by Pakistan, given by Pakistan in gift to China. And ladies and gentlemen, it is from here that the Karakoram Highway passes into Pakistan, Baltistan and all these areas. Okay. So let me clear this and let me bring in a few more things now. Uh, it's not okay. This is the LAC discussion. This is we are going to discuss the LAC discussion. Remember one thing: LAC is line of actual control. Actual control. Now this is 740 km long in one particular stretch in what is called Aksai Chin area. 740 km long. No, no, sorry. This is, uh, yeah. okay. I think there is a disturbance here. We'll come back to this in a while. Now the boundary between India and China is uh, about 34, 88 km long and uh, India boundary between India and Pakistan is 33 10 kilometers long. I think I just uh, skip, you know, switch the numbers. So um, this is uh, India Park is 33 10 and India China is 34 88. The longest boundary that India has is between, is in 
Bangladesh, which is 4096 kilometers. Okay, so uh, this boundary that we have with China, it has, you know, it's China is a huge country, it occupied Tibet in 1950, in the late 1950s. So you see this is all, you know, Tibet was not strictly part of China, but then that's how life is. So it is now, you see this, it borders, you know, China, uh, Kashmir's part, that is Ladakh, today's Aksachin, then Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Sikkim, and Natural Pradesh. These are all states on the boundary with China. Okay. China has historically claimed three parts. One is the whole of Arunachal Pradesh. It says Arunachal Pradesh is ours. They have always referred in their maps to Arunachal Pradesh as Jhangnan. What is the place? They call it Jhangnan. This is otherwise called South Tibet. In their maps, they call it South Tibet or Jhangnan. Okay. Now, um, they also contest certain boundary areas in Uttarakhand and Punjab, uh, so Uttarakhand and uh, Himachal Pradesh. And the third area is Aksachin, which they occupy, you know, to the extent of about 37,000 square kilometers. So this is uh, a notch, you know, the LAC line of actual control is a notional demarcation line between the Indian controlled areas and China controlled areas, especially in JNK, uh, Ladakh, that area, it's actually JNK, it's actually Ladakh now, earlier it was JNK, now it's called Ladakh, because if you see this, this entire area is all Ladakh, this is all Ladakh, JNK now, Kashmir JNK is the unitary of JNK would be like this, okay. This uh, Gilgit, large portions of Baltistan, Aksachin, they are all in Ladakh. Now, India owns Aksachin, but is occupied by China. Okay. Now, to go to war with China is not something that we, we should even wish for, because China is a pretty powerful country. All said and done, with all the nationalism aside, my friends, um, the reality is the Chinese military is extremely powerful, though they haven't seen much of war action in the recent years. 62 uh, is when they fought war against India, but they inflicted a humiliating defeat on, you know, India. Uh, early 70s is when their forces last fought, that was in the Vietnam War. That's about it. They haven't had much of battlefield experience, but Today, we live in a world of technology, in the era of technology, we need better technology, better air force, better missiles, better cyber equipment and everything, which the Chinese possess in abundance. So I think somewhere down the line, we need to be pretty careful. Uh, war rhetoric is fine that, um, you know, we may say that, look, you know, we are a powerful country, we have a bigger army, which is true, bigger army than China. Because China says that we don't need such a large army now. We live in an era of technology. We need a lean, mean army, lean, mean defense force. And you know what prompted them to have a lean, mean um, defense force, which is today 50% of the, which is down where the person and the number of people in the defense forces are down by 50% since the early 90s. You know why? Because in 1991, they saw Iraq, which at the time had the fourth largest military uh, in the world. It was cleaned up in a matter of about four days by the US-led coalition uh, in the war, the you know, Gulf War concerning Kuwait. Just, you know, superior air force cleaned up Iraq in a matter of days. So, you know, China has realized that it's better to have a leaner, meaner machine, a military you know, that would, you know, protect, you know, better than have a heavy personal army there that may not do the job. So China is quite different in its approach, my friends. I'm not a great fan of China, but life is like that. And one more thing, uh, you look at Sikkim there, Sikkim was not a part of India in 1947. Uh, Remember, Sikkim became a part of India in 1975. Till then, it was an independent Buddhist country. So it was in 1975 that Sikkim became a part of India and merged, uh, no, it, it, the kingdom of Sikkim became a part of India. So that's about it. See, you, you must have realized that, you know, recently for the Asian Games also, uh, some Arunachal Pradesh athletes were not given 
visas by the Chinese. They were given stapled visas. Stapled visas means uh, you know they they took some paper and they said that the, uh, to the passport they attached a visa, stapled visa to us. They said, look, you are from our own state, Arunachal Pradesh. You are from South Tibet. Why do you need a passport to come? Why do you need a visa to come to your own country, China? That's what they said. That's their philosophy. But the Chinese are evil. Keep that out. Uh, that's how life is. And uh, today, the LAC is between India and China, and the LOC is between India and Pakistan. And remember, LOC is the ceasefire line of 1948-49. Okay. So. Um, Let's go to our normal talks. Of which African country was Muhammad Nadir Laboi appointed the Prime Minister by its President Abdul Majid Tibun? It's Algeria. You see that country in orange? Algeria. Algeria is a pretty large country. Africa's biggest country by area. Its area is about 23.8 lakh square kilometers. I think a little over 23 lakh square kilometers. So 23 lakh square kilometers would make it the 10th largest in the world, I think, and uh, the largest in Africa. Um, it's a country that's going through a lot of political turmoil. So is this country, Tunisia. Tunisia's capital is Tunis. In fact, the country Tunisia is named after Tunis, the capital. And who is the leader here? Kais Saeed. The president of Tunisia is K. Saeed. Egypt's president is Abdel Fateh Al Sisi. These are right spellings, my friends. Morocco is monarchy, Muhammad the sixth. Muhammad the sixth. Albania is a Muslim country. It's here. You see this in you know this blue here. This is Albania. This in fact it's a very tiny country. It's um, you know, its prime minister is Eddie Rama. Eddie Rama. It's the Muslim majority country. Uh, the prime minister there is Eddie Rama. Okay. You see this here, Iberian Peninsula. This is Portugal, Spain, and a place called Andorra. It's here. Okay. A N D O R R A. Andorra, Spain, and uh, Portugal together make Iberia. This region is called Iberia. Fair. Which institution has unveiled a new operational framework for building climate resilient and low carbon health systems? The WHO, World Health Organization. We discussed WHO in the previous class, so we will discuss something more now. World Meteorological Organization. Meteorological, meteorological organization. Okay, it's headquartered in Geneva. In fact, both are headquartered in Geneva, which is uh, a city in Switzerland. And uh, the WMO's secretary, sorry, yeah, secretary general is a guy called, uh, what's his name? Uh, Petteri, Petteri Talas. Petteri Talas. He is from Finland, if I'm not wrong. Finland. IMF we discussed in the previous class, so did we discuss about UNICEF, uh, UNESCO, or maybe just let's bring in something more. United Nations Education and Scientific and Agricultural Organization, this is headquartered in Paris, and uh, UNICEF, while UNICEF is headquartered in uh, the United Nations Children's Fund is headquartered in New York, New York. If you want to know who heads this, UNESCO is headed by Dr. Audrey Ajule. Audrey Azule, while UNICEF is run by Kathy or Catherine Russell. Prithviraj Singh Oberoi passed away recently. He was known as the man who changed the face of the hospitality industry in India, which is the hotel industry, the hotel industry. You know, um, he started, his father started a company called East India Hotels. He was the chairman emeritus of this company, East India Hotels. He, this company, East India Hotels, EIH, owned two major brands, Oberoi, most of which are luxury properties, and the second is Trident, Trident Hotels. 
Okay. So Prithira Singh Oberoi, he was nicknamed Bicky. In some places you will find only Bicky. There are three prominent hotel chains in India. Three. One is the Taj Group. Taj Group is officially called the Indian Hotels Company Limited. The Indian Hotels Company Limited, which is Taj, Vivanta, Ginger, uh, a brand called Selections, then a brand called um, Gateway. Okay. Then, um, then there is this brand called ITC. Okay. ITC wanted to buy buy out East India Hotels. Slowly they were purchasing shares in the market. But then they made their intentions clear that we wish to acquire East India Hotels. But this man didn't want to sell his hotel chain to ITC. So what he did was he sold about 14% of his shares to Reliance Industries. So Mukesh Ambani and family today own, today own about 20% over long, long some 15 years, they have accumulated shares that shares about uh, to the tune of 20% of the total capital of East India Hotels. So the majority shareholder of East India Hotels is the Ambani family. Okay, there is a term here FMCG, fast moving consumer goods. What are fast moving consumer goods? See consumer goods are final products which you and I buy. We buy fast moving goods like you know, consumer goods like toothpaste, biscuits, chocolates, you know, um, cigarettes, cold drinks, stuff like that. In fact, when you walk into a department store, most of the food stuffs, most of the everyday stuff is FMCG. But some of these have a very high demand and consequently, consequently, they keep moving off the shelf pretty fast. Because they have a high demand, they are called fast moving consumer goods shampoos, biscuits, chocolates, they have pretty high demand. So they keep moving off OF off the shelf, OFF off the shelf pretty fast. Okay, you have FMC, FMCG companies like, you know, Nestle, Hindu Sun Limited, PNG, Godrej, ITC's FMCG, Sunface Biscuits. Hmm? Canada defeated Italy to win the Billie Jean King Cup 2023 for the first time. The Billie Jean King Cup is the premier uh, international competition, team competition in women's tennis. Billie Jean King was uh, is still around, of course. Um, she won, you know, she's a former world number one women's tennis player. She has won 39 Grand Slam titles, my friends. 39 Grand Slam titles. She also was the captain of the US Fed Cup team, Federation Cup or Fed Cup. So you have Davis Cup for men and Federation Cup for women. Now this is, you know, Federation Cup is called Billie Jean King Cup. This tournament, this year's tournament was won by Canada, having defeated Italy. Now the most titles have been won by the United States. 18 times they have won the Billie Jean Cup, which was started in 1963. 1963. 1963, the Billie Jean King Cup was started. Uh, you know, but since then, 18 times it has been won by the United States. The United States. With which country has South Korea signed an agreement aimed at deterring North Korea's advancing nuclear and missile threat? Well, it has signed this deal with the US. Uh, this is a story I will tell you in the next class. I, I love these kinds of stories. Stories that talk about war, that talk about how differences in opinions can lead to massive tragedies. Hmm? We'll discuss this in the next class. I'm going to bring this question back just like we discussed LAC and LOC. We could discuss this a little more you know, in greater detail. Under which country is India readying its own ready to develop its own long-range air defense system planned to be deployed by 2829. Kusha, what is it? Kusha. Under this, India is going to launch, India is going to develop um, LRSAM. What is LR? Long-range SAM, surface to air missiles. So to hit a target, launch from surface and hit a target in the air, that is SAM. India has Akash, Trishul, SAM missiles. Uh, then Prithvi is surface to surface, SSM it's called. So under this particular project, Kusha, India is going to launch uh, LRSAM, which is uh, a mobile platform, which is which can you know intercept 
incoming missiles at different you know um, distance different ranges 150 kilometers 250 kilometers 350 kilometers and everything so we want to develop our own what is called iron dome system okay or the russians have s400 triumph so we want to develop our own air defense system which could stop kill incoming missiles before they could do any damage so the following is our the late, late uh, sorry latest cricketers to be inducted in the icc hall of fame icc hall of fame all three of them who was arvind de silva sri lankan um, batsman he was also bowler and there are few, you know weird things about him weird not exactly weird but yeah unique things about him uh, he played 93 test matches and i think he scored 636 one runs so 63 63 runs you can say you know in uh, 90 93 test matches now i want you to remember one more thing he also scored 20 centuries 20 centuries um 20 centuries now one last thing i would like to tell you is that he is one unique batsman and one unique bowler in one sense he is the only batsman to score a double century in his last test innings last inning test innings he scored a double century and with the last ball of his last test match that is in the same test he took a wicket this was against bangladesh so against bangladesh arvind de silva scored a double century in his last test innings and with the last ball he you know his last ball he took a wicket he is the only bats only player in the world to have done this double century in the last innings and wicket in the last delivery Virendra Sehwag, a great man. Um, Virendra Sehwag scored 23 centuries. I remember this is he played about, um, you know, um, I'm not very sure how many, uh, little over 100, 104 tests. He scored 80, um, 83, no, 85, 85, 86 runs, 8,586 runs. That's how I remember. 85, 86. Okay. um he scored these many runs in uh, 104 tests and he scored 23 centuries he also scored a triple century i mean that and he is the first guy i think to have scored a double century in odis yeah the second guy the first guy was sachin tendulkar i think he scored 200 again gwalior but then seva broke the record now i think the record is held by someone else i guess rohit sharma someone Diana Adulji was an Indian player she also kept in the side and she holds one particular record for having bowled the maximum maximum number of balls deliveries you know in women's cricket she bowled nearly 5098 balls you know in in, in uh, you know women's cricket no player has ever done no you know bowler has ever done this particular thing okay the international cricket council's hall of fame has inducted these three bongo sagar is the fourth edition of the bilateral by means to lat means side two sided exercise between or two between two sides between the indian navy and the bangladesh navy so there are a lot of exercises that we have with all these countries um this involve learning best practices from the others basically Russia and Indian Navy has had one exercise called um, Indian Navy Russian Navy Indra Indra I N D R A Indra India and Omani we are talking about only naval exercises so Russia with Russia Indra with Omani Nasim Al Bahar Nasim N A S E E M Nasim Al L Al Bahar B A H A R Al Bahar Nasim Al Bahar and coming to the french we have had this varuna naval exercise varuna varuna v a r u n a varuna as far as japanese is concerned uh, it's very easy to remember jimex j i m e x which is japan india maritime exercises okay 
India has been ranked here dash in the list of 129 countries in the world in the inclusiveness index 2023. Okay. I went through the entire index. I looked at the different parameters they use. They use race, they use gender, they use um, disability, they use um, religion and they use LGBTQ+. On these parameters, how does a society react or how do people treat each other? India ranks once 17th out of 129. Can you believe this? You know, 129 ranks, India ranks 117. Why I don't trust these rankings is very simple. See, um, you have this country called South Sudan. South Sudan. Its rank was 89. Now, South Sudan has a massive civil war going on because of, yeah, um, rivalry, factions, political factions, civil war conditions. This country does not treat people with of a different race in a well in a good way. It treats people who are disabled in the, with, you know, utter indifference. Uh, coming to LGBTQ plus. They do not recognize this. In fact, people are stoned to death in this, on this. Then religion. Oh man, they are fighting on this basically. Yeah. So if you look at, um, yeah, I guess this should be, yeah, gender. And women are treated in, a, in an extremely bad way in this country. Yet, this country is ranked 89 and India is ranked 117. Crazy, isn't it? Now, one more thing I would like to tell you is that look at a country like Iran. Iran is ranked 129, okay, the last, Iran is last, but a country like Yemen is ranked one step above Yemen. I see, I have no love for Yemen or anything, but I can tell you Yemen treats people badly on these parameters than Iran does, okay. And if you look at LGBTQ+, yes, if you look at China, 98. In China, rank is 98, India is 117. Think about China. Racially, they don't treat people in a nice way. They believe that the Chinese race, which is the majority of whom are Han ethnic group, they don't treat people of other you know, ethnic groups in a better way, in a good way. They don't treat, they have a great deal of discrimination when it comes to religion because the state itself discriminates on grounds of religion. Everything has to be state sanctioned. There is a mosque, it has to be approved by the central government. If there is a church, it has to be approved by the government. So the Muslims, for example, the Muslims in China, they nearly 5 million Muslims, 50 lakh Muslims have been detained, jailed, put in prisons, concentration camps. Yet China ranks above India. You know, I mean, you have to, this is a very bad way of ranking. See. Most of these rankings are, are function products of, you know, the certain kind of imagery that countries have. For example, when it comes to India, they say that, you know, women are always treated badly in India. Not always, my friends. Things are changing. And we are much better than countries like, you know, uh, countries like South Sudan. Trust me. Much, much better. You just have to read a bit about South Sudan. I took this one example because, you know, um, they have a flawed way of understanding and most of these rankings they take a small sample size and they ask only certain people I have found my own dismay I have found the respondents a lot of these respondents they take a sample size of 5,000 people okay so will 5,000 people represent a country of one you know 40 crore people Not right. yes uh, yes, there are a lot of differences. There are a lot of things not going well for our country, but we are much better than what these kinds of rankings portray, my friends. Okay, um, the best countries, New Zealand. One is New Zealand. The highest inclusiveness um, is in New Zealand. Second is Portugal. Portugal. Third is Netherlands. See now, countries like Portugal are okay. But if you, if you had looked 100 years back, they would treat any person who is not a Catholic in a very bad way. Yes. Okay. India, the US had 12 other members of the Indo-Pacific Framework, uh, Economic Framework for Prosperity Grouping, signed a Supply Chain Resilience Agreement. Uh, IPEF was launched in uh, 
Tokyo, Japan in the Indo-Pacific region. Okay, fair. Um, there's a 12 members. Uh, who are the 12 members? Some of the members basically. So one, India, two, US, three, Fiji, four, Australia, five, New Zealand, six, Philippines, okay, um, seven, uh, what is that, uh, Singapore, eight, sorry, eight, Malaysia, Malaysia, nine, what is that, we have come to, Indonesia, 10, Vietnam, oh, we skipped one country in the region, we have Brunei, Malaysia, Brunei, and 12 is Japan, hmm? 12 is Japan, all 12 members have come, so this 2 plus, you know, uh, I know there is 12 plus, no, yeah, 13 will be South Korea, South Korea and there is one more in my country. I skipped it. Thailand. So 14 countries. Hmm? It's easy to remember these things. You just have to look at okay, this region, what are the countries in this region? That's it. Okay. Canberra, as you know, is the capital of Australia. New York is the biggest city in the United States. Tokyo is the biggest city and capital of uh, Japan. Seoul is so is the case with Seoul in South Korea. It's pronounced Seoul. Beijing, the second biggest city and the capital of uh, China. Okay. Identify the correct statements about the Institute of International Education. All of them. Um, see, uh, India is sending most number of students in you know. Um, India and of course um, China sent the most number of students, in, you know, for study, you know, uh, to US for academic purposes. But of late, the charm of the United States is going down because of the uncertainty concerning jobs. So is the case with Japan, you know, uh, so is the case with Canada, United Kingdom. Europe is very expensive when it comes to academics, certain kinds of academics. But overall, you know, the lure of the foreign education idea has always bugged, you know, bugged Indians, has been bugged, you know, has bugged Indians for a long time. Right? So, I wouldn't find fault with them because um, to each their own. Today we send the largest number of international, largest number of students to the US, my friends. We, con we contribute nearly 50 billion dollars, over 50, 55 billion dollars to you know, through American GDP, my friends. Oh, more than them. I think almost $100 billion. Defense Minister Rajnath Singh will represent India at the 10th ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus in Jakarta. In the previous class, we discussed the ASEAN members. Uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So, what are, oh, what are the names of these countries? If you look at ASEAN, the headquarters are in Jakarta. Headquarters in Jakarta, which is the capital of Indonesia as of today. Then um, um, you have 10 members. ASEAN has 10 members. Its secretary general is Kim Kao. Kim Kao from Cambodia. Cambodia. Look at choices here. Look at choice one. Bandar Seri Begawan is the capital of the small country of Brunei. What is it? Brunei. B R U N E I. Brunei is an Islamist. Um, it's it's a small Islamic kingdom. Its uh, ruler is a guy called Muda Hassan Al Wadullah Bolkia. Simply call him Hassan Bolkia. Hassan Bolkia. B O L K I H. Um, you know, this um, guy at one time was the richest man in the world. Of course, now he's one of those, one of the richest guys. So, Bandar Seri Begawan, um, capital of Brunei, Manila, capital of Philippines, Singapore, Singapore. Look at choice five, Sri Jayavardhane Pure Kotte. This also is the capital of Sri Lanka. When I say also, there are two capitals Sri Lanka has. 
One is Columbia, sorry, Colombo, the other is Sri Jayavardhane Pure Kotte. Look, this is where some part of the government sits. So it's more of an executive, legislative, administrative capital. Okay. So there are two capitals of Sri Lanka, Colombo and Sri Jayavardhane Pura Kotte. As per the IQ Air report, which is the most polluted city in the world with an air quality index of 27. See, this keeps these kind of things keep changing. As of today, it's Delhi that's the most polluted city. But uh, once the season, when summer comes in, things will change. That's how these are, my friends. Okay. Um, but Delhi is considered a gas chamber. It's not good. Things are not good, my friends. It's impacting the kids of almost every person living in Delhi. Especially the vulnerable folks like um, uh, patient, no? um, you know, medically ill patients. Then you have uh, little fellows, little kids. I mean, it's impacting them much more than someone who's young and, you know, of robust health. But overall, in the last four years, if you look at the four year period, which the website of IQ Air shows, in the last four years, the world's most polluted city has been Lahore. What is that? Lahore. The most polluted city in the world is Lahore. And the most polluted country in the world is Chad. C-H-A-D. Chad. Which is, which is in Africa. Just below Libya, you will find Chad. C-H-A-D. Yeah. World's most polluted country, Chad. World's most polluted city over a four-year period, Lahore, Pakistan. Subrita Roy, who passed away recently, was a founder of Sahara Group. Okay, uh, he was arrested for you know for committing scams and all that. Let's not get there. SR Group um, is owned by the Ruya family. Like the Ambani family owns Reliance Industries. Um, you know you have the SR Group, which is owned by the Ruya R U I A. Now, if you look at the name SR S R, there are two sounds. You know E S S S E R R. Sashi and Ravi Ruya brothers started this group. S for Sashi, R for Ravi Ruya. Surname is Ruya. R U I A. Two persons from Denmark started this LNT company. LNT is Larsen and Tubro, as it's as is mentioned. Larsen and Tubro. Um, were two De people, two persons from Denmark, whose first names were. Uh, Henning Hawk, Henning simply, Henning Larsen and Soren Tubro, S O R E N, so Soren Tubro. So they started this company and today it's one of the world's biggest engineering companies. DLF, Delhi Land and Finance, Delhi Land and Finance. Okay, this is I think India's largest real estate company, Delhi Land and Finance. Godrej Group, yeah, fair. Adi Godrej is the chairperson. Adi Godrej. With which bank has India signed a $4 million um, policy based loan to support its urban reform agenda for creating high quality urban infrastructure, improving service delivery, and promoting efficient governance systems? Asian Development Bank. Headquartered in Manila, M A N I L A, Manila. We mentioned in you know, the Philippines a while ago. Philippines is capital is Manila and okay let's do one thing let's look at only the heads of these organizations okay um, not all some of them um, you look at ADB Masat Sugu Asakawa Masat Sugu M A S A T S U G U Masat Sugu Asakawa A S A K A W A Masat Sugu Asakawa Choice A, IBRB, International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. You could write part of World Bank Group, part of World Bank Group, dash, headed by Ajay Banga. Ajay Banga, B A N G A. Look at choice two, ECB. European Central Bank is headed by Christine Lagarde. Christine Lagarde. 
L A G A R D E Christine Lagarde New Development Bank NDB Choice 4 New Development Bank is headed by Dilma Rousseff Dilma D I L M A Dilma Rousseff R O U S S E F R O U S S E F Rousseff Look at 5 Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank It is run by Jin J I N Jin Likan L I Q U N Likan Jin Likan Okay Chinese fellow which country's regulatory body has granted an accelerated approval for the world's first vaccine for chicken gunya named X chick? Now, chicken gunya is a debilitating disease, it's an infectious disease. Um, a mosquito that is impacted, that is infected with chicken gunya virus, uh, you know, if it bites a person, you know, the person may develop chicken gunya fever. Chicken gunya is, you know, it's a serious, it's accompanied by two things. One, Fever, high fever, second, extreme joint body, you know, joint, you know, joint pains. You know, they impact elbows, they impact knees, oh, it's terrible. So the world's first such vaccine has been launched. Hopefully, many people who have uh, who live in tropical places which are full of mosquitoes and everything, you know, uh, they have better access. But you know what? These days because the world is getting warmer every year. The areas in which mosquitoes in the past had lived, bred and spread is actually increasing. The areas, area is increasing. Oh, it's a terrible thing for those countries. Look at Italy. There has been a swarm of mosquito deaths, my friends. I mean, Italy, Southern Europe actually. Earlier, one could never hear of these kinds of deaths People regarded these deaths as um, deaths, um, you know, as third world country deaths or poor country deaths, which are most in Africa and along the equator, actually. Hmm? Things are changing. Perverse. Okay, there we go. Which world renowned author has been awarded the inaugural Lifetime Disturbing the Peace Award by Vaclav Havel Center on Food in the Mall? Vaclav Havel was, is the ex-president of Czechoslovakia and of course Czech Republic. Uh, coming to Salman Rushdie, that's the author, my friend. Salman Rushdie uh, was born in India but um, has since lived in Britain and the US. He, is, he won the Booker Prize in 1981 for his novel Midnight's Children. Midnight's Children. Salman Rushdie uh, became pretty controversial. He gained worldwide notoriety. That is, uh, he became infamous the world over after the government of India banned his book, uh, um, The Satanic Verses. The Satanic Verses, V E R S E S. You know, The Satanic Verses uh, is allegedly a book about you know uh, that about Islam, about the in the, in the Islamic prophet Muhammad and all. Now, uh, you need to understand that India was the world's first country to ban this. And uh, there was a death threat, that is fatwa issued against him by the Iranian religious leader, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini. That was on 14th February 18, 19, 1989. So Salman Rushdie got this death threat, you know, uh, Khomeini, Ayatollah Khomeini told the people, the Muslims, that if you are a true Muslim, you go and kill him, we'll give you money. So there was a booty on his death. So Salman Rushdie for a long, long, long time lived under police protection and his police protection would cost the British government one million pounds a year. No one would know where he lived except his publisher, he, his own secretary and of course those policemen protecting him, no one would know. He used to change his homes almost every month. That was under you know, uh, security detail basically. Now recently he was um, stabbed by I think a, a guy from Iran or somewhere, you know, in the eye. He lost one eye and uh, things are like that. Hmm? J.K. Rowling, the creator of the Harry Potter series, uh, J.M. Kurtzi, marvelous, extraordinary writer my friends. 
I've read all of them. Uh, J.M. Kodzi, John Maxwell Kodzi is an Australian writer. Because see, earlier, he was born in South Africa. He lived in South Africa for a long time, but then he moved to Australia. Kodzi is the winner of the Booker Prize on two occasions. So is choice five. So is choice four. Okay. Kodzi, Atwood, Carey, the, and there is a lady named Hilary Mantle. Yeah, all four of them have won the Booker Prize twice. I guess, yeah, twice. Um, if you want to write the names of one of these books, Kodzi, Disgrace. Disgrace, D-I-S-G-R-A-C-E. Margaret Atwood, The Blind Assassin. The Blind Assassin, A-S-S-A-S-S-I-N. Blind Assassin. The last one, Peter Carey. Peter Carey is the author of books like the Kelly Gang, I'll give you a short title. The Kelly Gang, K-E-L-L-Y, Kelly Gang, G-A-N-G. It's a long title, but this is enough. Name the Indian skydiver who also became the first woman to jump off a helicopter from a height of about 22,000 feet in front of the world's highest peak, Mount Everest. She is a popular skydiver and very brave woman, I would say. She's the Mahajan. Um, she is, um, you know, uh, she's broken multiple records. She's, she holds multiple records now. But I want to tell you about Mount Everest. See, Mount Everest is the world's tallest peak. Earlier, it used to be 84, sorry, 88, 48 meters, 88, 48 meters. Now they say it's 88, 49 meters couple of you know, two three years back the Chinese and Nepalese um, you know uh, scientists uh, they said that the height of the Everest is going up by one inch now one meter um, let's see I mean I'm, I'm see I'm not a great fan of uh, numbers actually but that's uh, height actually eight eight four nine meters now where is Mount Everest on the boundary between China and Nepal if we uh, this is the boundary where I'm sitting is boundary Mount Everest is bang on the boundary. If this is Nepal and this is China, you can climb from the Nepal side and go to China. And you can do it from the other side also. The similar thing from the other side. Who were the first people to climb Everest? Two men uh, in 1959 climbed the Everest. One was Tenjing Norge of Nepal. Tenjing Norge. And the second guy was uh, named uh, Edmund Hillary. Edmund Hillary, he was from New Zealand. Who was the first Indian man Avtar Singh Chima, Avtar Singh Chima, 1965, Avtar Singh Chima, okay, and then first Indian woman, Bachandri Pal, Bachandri Pal, Bachandri Pal went there in 1984, 1984. Russia has signed a contract to supply Igla's Igla S missiles to India and allow its production in India under license. All of them are right. So man portable means one can hold the portable defense and fire a missile. Of course, one has to be pretty strong to be able to hold that. Yeah, uh, it can be brought down. It can bring down. It can be used to bring down enemy aircraft, missiles, drones, and everything else. But it's it's a very you know it's an expensive one. But so the government of India is saying that today we will buy from you. Tomorrow you will do TOD transfer of technology. So we will buy it, but from your license, under your license, basically. Okay. Who is the first batsman to score 700 runs in a single World Cup cricket edition? Virat Kohli scored 765 runs in the ICC Cricket Men's World Cup. ICC Cricket Men's World Cup, highest runs, Virat Kohli, 765. I think uh, he scored three centuries as well. Three centuries in 12, 11 matches he scored Three centuries and six fifties. Three centuries and six fifties. Overall, seven sixty-five runs. Most wickets. Most wickets. Mohammad Shami. Our Mohammad Shami. He bowled exceedingly well. We all know this, now. He took twenty-four wickets in eleven matches. Not eleven matches. Fewer matches actually. Uh, only after Hardik Pandya was uh, injured that Mohammad, Mohammad Shami brought in. And there was lots of memes over this. And many people say that um, thanks to Hardik Pandya, 
you know, Jami, you know, the biggest uh, reason why India could come to the finals is that Hardik Pandya got injured. I know it's a bad way of saying it, but then there are memes, and memes are just takes on funny, you know, weird things, everyday weird things. So Virat Kohli 765 runs, three centuries and six fifties, and um, coming to wickets, Mohammad Shami. Uh, 24 wickets and he once took I think um, in the semi-final or somewhere no the last match he scored round robin last match 7 for 57 7 wickets he took in one match and uh, Australia won the world cup of course as you all know they beat India they beat India and what is the economy rate of um, you know of um, what is his name uh, strike rate of um, Show me 10.7 for every 10th ball he actually took a wicket. Hmm. The Silk Yara Temple project suffered a collapse. Collapse. It broke down actually. Part of the tunnel collapsed, blocking the way of 41 workers. Not trapping 40, 40 workers, 41 workers. Most likely today they could be freed. They could be brought out, my friends. So, answer is Uttarakhand. They are near Uttar Kashi in Uttarakhand. With which nation did India, did the, uh, did the US sign a landmark deal that would allow it to export nuclear technology and materials to decarbonize and boost energy independence? The Philippines. Now, I'll tell you something about the Philippines. The Philippines, my friends, so is this country in, uh, it's an archipelago in the Pacific Ocean, just east of Indonesia and uh, Malaysia. Uh, one thing you need to know that it between, nine, between 1898 and 1946, between 1898 and 1946, the United States ruled Philippines. Before that, it was Spain that ruled Philippines. Between 1568 and 1898, Spain ruled Philippines. In fact, the country Philippines gets its name from the name of a Spanish king, Philip II. So, in 1898, America and Spain went to war because Spain had occupied large parts of American continent, Western United States, you know, uh, Arizona, California and all these areas were under Spanish occupation. The Americans asked them to withdraw, leave, give those, you know, so that, you know, give them up so that America could incorporate them into their own territory. But the Spanish said no. So they went to war. As they went to war, Spain lost the war, 1898. They lost the war and America asked for reparations. Not just that, they said, we will oh, you know, we'll take over your foreign territories. So they took over two territories. One is Philippines, the other is Guam. So between 1898 and 1946, Philippines was ruled by United States. But Guam, the other territory that US took from Spain, still remains under US control. G-U-A-M, it's an island in the Pacific Ocean. Now, Philippines is bothered by China, so they are going back to the US, which with whom they have given up, they had given up relationship in the recent past, but now they are going back into the embrace of the United States. Okay. Its president is a guy called Marcos Bong Bong. Philippines president Marcos, M-A-R-C-O-S, Marcos Bong Bong, B-O-N-G, B-O-N-G. Which country hosted the second Voice of Global South Summit in the virtual format? India. India, my friends. Okay. Voice of Global South. All these developing countries in Africa, South America, Asia, they came together. India brought them together. And India is now, you know, said to be more or less the unannounced leader of the Global South. The 12th parliamentary election of Bangladesh will be held in January uh, this uh, next year. The Bangladeshi parliament is known as Jatiya Songsad. Jatiya Songsad, National Parliament. That's the spelling. Sansad is the name of the Hindi name of the Indian parliament. Majlis Shura is a Pakistani parliament. Majlis Shura, Pakistani parliament. Majlis Watani Ittihad, Iranian parliament, parliament of Iran. The last one, National People's Congress is the Parliament of China. So repeat, first India, two, one India, two, uh, Pakistan, three, Bangladesh, four, Iran, five, China. 
Now, you know who designed the Bangladeshi parliament? After this class, just type in, you know, uh, search for Jyotiyo Songsar. Beautiful building it is, my friends. Um, it was designed by the same guy who designed I am Ahmedabad, Louis Kahan. L O U I S, Louis Kahan, K A H A N, K A H N, sorry, K A H N, Louis Kahan. He was born in the old Soviet Union, basically Estonia. He was born in Estonia, but he became an American citizen later. Okay, there are a lot of disturbance, so I raised my voice. It's beyond our control, some other building kind of thing. So guys, let's look at the next. Oh, that's about it. Thank you for being here. Have a lot of fun. Thank you. Enjoy yourself. Stay curious.